So the topics that we hope to cover, you know, first is how do we combine model learning with rewards? And we look into the cross entropy method, which is a gradient free method for optimization. We look at several case studies for self-supervised model learning. And if we have time, we look at inverse models in this lecture, if not, then in the next lecture. So until now in the course, what we have looked at is a broad spectrum of methods. On one hand, you know, we have looked at reinforcement learning, which is completely self-learned. On the other extreme, you know, we looked at hard-coded behavior, right? Where we hard code each action that the robot needs to perform. And we also looked at things in the middle, right? For example, we looked at strips briefly. We went into much detail in behavior cloning and imitation learning. So, you know, one question that also comes up is, you know, we have done all of these learning based methods, but in many problems, good models are available, right? For example, if I need to push an object, I might have a model of pushing, right? Or if I, you know, want to grasp an object, you know, I might know how to compute forces and where to put my hand to grasp the object. So one question which comes up is, you know, why learn models in the first place. So this is something we touched upon in, you know, lecture one. But what I'm going to do is, you know, maybe revive some of those memories. And then we are going to look at how can we learn models. So for example, you know, last lecture, or the, like, the two lectures before, we ended up with imitation learning methods. And one problem setup we discussed was rope manipulation. So one question I can ask is, you know, because we know the physics of how a rope might move when subject to forces, so why can't we simply use physics to go from my start state to my goal state, right? For example, if I know a sequence of actions, I can simulate the effects of them and get to the goal state. So for example, let the physics simulator take the state xt as input and act and at as the action and outputs xt plus one, and we can recursively apply the physics simulator. In order to find these actions, we can pose an optimization problem where the objective function is that the last state should be as close to the goal state as possible. And we want to infer such actions while they obey the laws of physics. So we can you know, use this uh, formulation to infer the sequence of actions. Now, this method is good because I might change the goal to something different, right? as opposed to a knot. I might have a rope in a different configuration or even a different configuration. right? And the same method should work because physics is general. But similarly, you know, I could change my problem setup and I could go to pushing objects and still the same method works because physics is general. But the, but the place where we run into an issue is that we cannot feed images into a physics engine, right? So if I have observations from a camera and that is how I observe the world, then I can't feed that directly into a physics engine. What I need to do is to first figure out some quantities, for example, things like mass, friction, or shape, right? pretty much doing some form of inverse graphics, right? so that we can put them into a physics simulator, because physics simulators are based on these quantities. Now, what these quantities should be you know, is partly a part of system identification. And one trouble in system identification ends up being that for different tasks, there are different system identities, right? For example, because the hammer is rigid, you know, there is no need to consider non-rigid parameters. Right? Whereas if you are manipulating a rope, then stiffness thus becomes an important parameter that requires consideration. But maybe, you know, this 
the the system id is different for different tasks but it is tedious but maybe it is okay right maybe someone can sit down and try to come up with a general set of you know system id although it is tedious but even if i could come up with that there ends up being a second problem and the second problem is how do we actually estimate these parameters so one might say why not use computer vision which takes an image as input and outputs these parameters turns out this is a very hard prediction problem why is that because you know first just imagine how will you get supervision for these quantities i mean with imagenet we were trying to classify and given an image what category it belongs to like is it a cat or a dog but these are things which we can upload on the internet and get labels for because every, because humans generally understand what a cat or a dog or a table is but if i upload images of objects and ask human annotators to label their mass their friction that is not going to go well right so first is lack of supervised data to make these predictions accurately then second you know no matter what we do you know our predictions are not going to be accurate and as we simulate forward and predict future states as the horizon of prediction is going to increase these errors are going to accumulate so these two become challenges in using a completely model based approach where a model has been provided to us right now this is what you know is typically called as a classical model based control now what is a model over here just to you know reiterate a model is something which is taking my current state and action as inputs and outputting what is going to happen in the future so because to understand you know this issue in slightly more detail let's consider an example where i throw a feather and a stone from top of a tower and i ask a question will the stone fall first now obviously the stone is going to fall first um which is what we know from our experience in the world but suppose if we were to solve this problem from the lens of classical control the way of doing this would be to first take this feather and from this you know predict things like the mass and the shape and the air drag just imagine getting the shape of this feather correctly it's a hard problem to solve and therefore if these parameters are not accurate maybe my time to fall is also going to be inaccurate now you might say well i am fine with approximate shape but what should that approximate shape be for example you might say well i can approximate this feather with maybe an oval or maybe a cylinder and that is all right that is sufficient but if i were to now go and grasp an object then approximating it by a coarse shape is not going to work because for grasping i really care about the fine details of the object so you know we run into this issue that you know either our predictions are inaccurate and if we try to define them in a way where approximations work then approximations are very task specific on the other hand you know we could from our experience have a model which says that things which have furry texture tend to fall slower than things which have you know like solid texture or which look like a stone now these now predicting the texture of this object is easy from a computer vision standpoint and that's what most object classification methods end up doing they're doing some form of texture classification but you know texture is not going to be fed into the physics engine right if we have access to texture we rely on experience to form associations 
that which texture is falling slower than which other texture. So the issue over here is that some representations are easier for vision, for example, predicting the texture, while other representations such as mass shape and air drag are easy for us to apply physics to, but they're hard for vision. So where we are stuck is at the interface. I have my images coming in. I need to get the right interface so I can simulate the future. And the question becomes is, you know, what is this appropriate representation? Now there is a lot of work which looks at task specific setups and, and comes up with representations which are appropriate for that particular task, right? But, you know, if, you know, we want to apply a method which can work generally across a bunch of tasks, it is unclear how do we choose this representation. So instead of trying to worry about what this representation is going to be, you know, why not learn end to end to go from my current observations to my future observations. So we are going to not worry about the interface problem and directly learn a model which goes from current observations and actions to future observations. So sometimes people would also call as intuitive physics. If we are applying these models in domain of physics, sometimes people would call this as end-to-end -end model learning. And the main motivation for doing this is to overcome this interface issue that we discussed about. So before we proceed ahead, you know, any questions on this part? I see nothing on the chat. So feel, feel free to interrupt if you have a question. So this part we covered before also. So maybe, you know, you're already familiar with this. So the next question, you know, is how do we learn such models and how do we leverage these models for control? So we talked about a physics problem, but you know, there are many other problems where models are just unknown, right? For example, if I'm looking at the stock market, we really don't have a good model of how stocks are going to behave or a good analytical model of how stocks are going to behave. Many times, you know, if I have an industrial plant, we don't have a precise model. Or many times, even in human robot interaction or in manipulation, the model ends up being unknown. Or if even if it is known, it is computationally very expensive to simulate. Or alternatively, it runs into the interface problem that we talked about. So how do we operate in these scenarios? So the, the thing that we're going to look is how do we interact with the system, collect some data and use that data to learn a model of how things are going to change in the future. And then we're going to leverage that model for control. So to put things concretely, what we want to do is to maximize the sum of rewards. My reward is a function of my state in action and I have a dynamics model, which says given the state and the action, predict the future state, but this is unknown. And a job is to infer the actions. Now, because this model is unknown, we are going to approximate it or with F hat. Now, how do I learn F hat? I'm in the state, I take an action, you know, suppose, Initially, because I have no information about the task, I might just end up taking a random action. And if I take a random action A and state ST, I will end up at ST plus one, and that becomes my triplet for learning the model. Right? So I can pose my prediction problem as given ST and AT, predict ST plus one, and I can take the L2 loss between ST plus one and S hat T plus one right, to learn the model. So once I have this model, right, 
I I can you know I already know what the reward R one is going to be for my state one if I take action A one. But what about rewards in the future? So instead of actually taking these actions in the real world, what we can do is to imagine where these actions are going to lead us in the future. Right? For example, I can simulate that if I take action S1 and A1, I will end up in state S2. Right? And I can use this to compute the reward. Similarly, I can apply this function F recursively to predict future states and thereby also compute future rewards. So if G ends up being differentiable over here, which means the reward function is differentiable. And because we learned F hat in a parameterized form, this parametric form is also differentiable, which means that the relationship between actions to rewards is given by a differentiable function. So now in order to infer actions, we can simply make use of backdrop. Like right? what do I mean by backdrop? I can find gradients with respect to the actions right? and optimize actions using those gradients. So I can say maximize some of rewards. The, fun the mapping from rewards to actions is differentiable. Therefore, I can use backpropagation to find the optimal set of actions. Does this make sense? Any questions on how we could use a learned model to infer the actions if my function G is differentiable? No questions. So maybe let me ask you a question. So what happens if G is non-differentiable? What, what, what would we end up doing in that scenario? Any suggestions from anyone? I'm going to open the chat window. The question is, you know, if G is non-differentiable, what what can we do over here? So one suggestion which comes up is we can do non gradient based optimization. Yes, so that is one possibility. Approximation by probabilistic inference. Do you want to say something more about that, Dongchi? Um, <laughs> it's a it's a random thought. I was curious whether possibly variational inference can be used here to approximate. Yeah, yeah it's random thought. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So maybe try recalling, you know, what we did in the previous lectures, right? When we were doing active critic methods, right? We were trying to learn a value function, for example, right? So one thing you know we could try to do is to just learn a model which predicts a reward from the state, right? And then we could have an end-to-end -end differentiable system. Right? So, but if the system, you know, itself is non-differentiable because of the way the system is set up, and we use function approximation to approximate it using a differentiable system, then, you know, my gradients are not going to be accurate. So, but, you know, many times the reward function is unknown, but it might be a differentiable function, right? So in those cases, you know, we can still leverage data to learn models, both of the dynamics, but also of the reward function, and then use backpropagation to infer the actions. Right, so that is one possibility. Now we are going to look at the other possibility, which was suggested, which is using non gradient based optimization. Okay. 
So one challenge which ends up happening in building the kind of system that I just described is that I am recursively applying the function f hat to predict the future. What can happen is my small errors, which might be there in f hat, can accumulate over time. Therefore, my predictions, which are far ahead in the future, might be inaccurate. And this is what leads to long horizon planning being challenging. Now, what do I mean by planning? Planning is inferring actions. What do I mean by long horizon? It means if I'm planning for t time steps ahead, where t can be a large number. So in the errors in f hat, or if you learned uh, approximation of the reward, right? Those errors can accumulate, leading to you know these challenges. So practically, what do we do to overcome it? So one thing we do is instead of planning a solution to the entire problem, what we do is we plan for edge steps, execute one step, and then replan for edge steps in the future. So this is known as the receding horizon control. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my rewards R1 to RH for edge time steps. Instead of maximizing the sum of rewards for the entire uh, time period, I'm only going to maximize it for edge steps right? and infer the actions for that. So this is a way for me to trade off you know, in approximations that or, or you know, errors in approximation that I have in learning F hat, right? With whether I will find the right solution to the problem. And so recall, you know, a similar trade-off was happening with discounting, right? So discounting at some points helped us make the bias variance trade-off, but it also meant that it changed the MDP that we were solving. Right, just to uh, uh, bring back a memory of an example that we saw, right? We saw this example of a cheetah. And if we made the discount factor to be very small, you know, the cheetah could run very quickly for one step, but it could run in an unstable way. So it falls down very soon. So discount factor was small, you know, that would be the optimal behavior. So sim like the similar in, in a similar so this receding horizon control of planning only for edge steps has a similar effect. You know we modify the problem so there is a chance that we are solving a different problem than what we intended to solve, but it also ensures that you know we will not accumulate too much error and therefore be able to find a good set of actions. So it's a similar trade-off that we you know, discussed. Okay. So any, any, any questions on what we just discussed? Does everyone follow why we need receding horizon control or what is the motivation for receding horizon control? Okay, well, let's move ahead. And if there are questions, let me bring them up. So now let's look at, you know, what are, you know, the possibilities of trying to figure out action. Like the one thing that we discussed was back propagation, but that does not need to be the only way. Essentially to solve a H, H time step problem, what we need to do is to propose an action sequence, an edge step action sequence. So suppose if I propose one action sequence, I get a reward of R1. For the second one, I get a reward of R2. Then if I you know, produce the nth one, I can get Rn. And I can simply choose the sequence which leads me to the highest reward. Then I'm going to execute the first action. 
and then I'm going to repeat the process. What process? I'm again going to find n different sequences of actions and then choose the one with the highest reward. So this can be a very simple way to implement receding horizon control. Right? The other way is, you know, instead of proposing actions, you use backprop to find one sequence of action, right? Both of them are valid ways of approaching the problem. But let's for a moment, you know, consider this approach of proposing action sequences. Now, the benefit of proposing action sequences is that we don't need G or even F hat to be differentiable because I don't need gradients to evaluate uh, or to find the actions, right? So I can just propose actions somehow and then evaluate which one of them are good and then make the choice. But this leads to a question, what action should be proposed in the first place? The simplest thing is to perform or to propose a random sequence of actions. Now for any reasonably complex problem, random search is not going to work. Right? We are unlikely to find a good solution by just proposing a random sequence of actions. Now there are better versions of doing random search. You know, one of them is genetic algorithms. And you know, there are some you know, other methods, one of which we look into is the cross entropy method. You know, this is also uh, like an evolutionary strategy method. So, so think of that if things are differentiable, I can do gradient based optimization. If things are non differentiable, I can do non gradient based optimization. Simplest way of doing this is random search. And then there are some more advanced algorithms, which are better than just doing random search. And we will look at one of them. And the one we're going to look is the cross entropy method. Before we get into the cross entropy method, any questions on receding horizon control? So suppose we are dealing with a scenario where my action space is continuous. In that case, what I'm going to do is to sample a sequence of H actions from a normal distribution, which has mean mu and covariance sigma. Right. And these parameters mu and sigma constitute the sampling distribution and we are going to update these parameters with time. So we can start with some guess, maybe mean zero, covariance one, and sample actions with that. So once I get these actions, I can use that to evaluate the reward. And you know we can sample, say, n sets of H actions each. Out of these n actions, we can choose the top J. Now these top J might be called as elites. Now what I can do is I can take these top J sets of actions and update my parameters mu and sigma to increase the likelihood of the top J actions. So I can perform a maximum likelihood estimation and I can wait the maximum likelihood estimation, like for each sample of actions, I can weight it by the reward. Now, once I get this new set of parameters, then we are going to again generate n sequence of our actions and keep on repeating this process over and over again. So, you know, we can try to write it down algorithmically. Out of these n actions, we're going to find the top actions, which is you know the top j. Using this, 
we are going to update my mean and my covariance matrix. And in case, you know, my actions were discrete and not continuous, you know, we can make use of a distribution which is not the Gaussian, we can make use of some other distribution and also update its parameters. So this method is called the cross entropy method. And this is widely used as a gradient free optimizer in model based control. Any questions on the cross entropy method? Any questions over here? No. Okay. So, you know, this cross entropy method and the forward models that we discussed have been applied, you know, on a bunch of problems. I'm going to show you some examples. So, in all of these examples, what we were doing is we are learning a forward model, which is ST80 predict ST plus one, and then use the cross entropy method to find the optimal sequence of action, right? So for example, we can learn when we rotate, you know, this object over here, when we move around balls in the hand or, you know, similarly, you know, write things on a paper, maybe manipulate a cube or even, you know, a move, a thread or a rope in the hand. And we can look at, you know, how training was progressing. So initially, you know, maybe the hand is not as good as moving them, but the time, you know, the hand becomes, you know, better and better at, you know, moving these balls. And let's look at, you know, how these systems were built. So we collect some data by interacting with the environment. We feed this data into a neural network to learn the model ST plus one to predict ST plus one from S and A. Now using this model, we try to find, so using this model and given a reward function, we try to find a good sequence of actions. Now we can find the sequence of actions, for example, by the cross entropy method. Now this particular paper uses a variant of cross entropy method, which ends up being slightly better. I'm not going to go into that detail, but if you are curious, I would recommend reading this paper. Now, once we find that good sequence of actions, I'm going to implement it on my hand, collect the data, you know, use it to update my model and, you know, repeat this loop. So note, you know, I am doing, I am learning the model as I'm trying to optimize the reward function. And we are doing this in a loop, right? Now, you know, some, now one question you might ask is, if I were to optimize the reward function, then why couldn't I just use something like PPO directly. Why am I trying to learn a neural network over here? Why am I trying to learn a dynamics model over here? Is there any advantage of doing that? Does anyone wants to, you know, take a guess or shout out or comment? of why you know, we should be learning models. Why can't I just do model free RL? So remember, right, I mean, one motivation, so okay, let, let, let us pop out a little bit, right? So, you know, we discussed about reinforcement learning and some challenges that we found in reinforcement learning were that it is task specific it ends up taking a lot of data. 
right? And things are not differentiable, and therefore we can we have to rely on reinforce, which has high variance. Then in classical control, you know, we have models. We can use those models, differentiate through them, and find the optimal actions, right? So we don't have to rely on reinforce to find us the actions. But then we found that there were issues in having models which work from raw sensory observations. Or sometimes we just don't have a model because the system is com complex, for example, the stock market. So now in those setups, you know, we might want to learn a model so that we can use more data efficient strategies to find the action, right? So one strategy could be to take gradient gradients to find the actions. The second perspective is that suppose the reward function is actually sparse. So in that case, unless I hit the reward, my model free algorithm is not going to learn. Because unless I get the reward, there's going to be no gradient. If there is no gradient, we are not going to update our parameters. If the parameters are not updated, that means no learning is happening, right? In contrast, you know, even if I don't get any reward, by any state action pair that I produce, I can leverage that data to improve upon my model, right? So in case I'm not getting the reward, I'm still using that data to learn a model. And you know, this model can you know, help us predict you know, rewards in the future and therefore ends up being helpful in doing action selection, right? Versus like in, if you were to think about, uh, you know, just pure model free RL, you know, you're just creating one action at a time and you're not really forecasting future states at all. Does that make, I mean, does it make sense of why we might be using models over here instead of using a model free system? So, so maybe I will just summarize. I think the two takeaways is, you know, one, we can leverage more efficient optimization-based methods if everything ends up being differentiated. Second, because models allow us to plan in the future, or once my system starts hitting the reward by, you know, a random exploration it is doing, then it can leverage the model to better select the actions so that it can reach the reward more often, more quickly. And, you know, turns out that, you know, this is also empirically true. For example, I'm showing you the like three, uh, you know, or I guess like two tasks that we previously can saw. One was the handwriting task and one, you know, saw was this ball manipulation task. So the green line is, what their method is, which is learning the dynamics model and then using a variant of cross entropy. And you have SSC and natural policy gradients given in blue and red. So what you end up finding is that this model based method can be much more sample efficient. Like as you can see from the X axis, but also they can be better. Now, if you're interested in, you know, what were the reward functions, I've just mentioned it, you know, feel free to have a look at the reward functions used for this task. Just to note, you know, these tasks were not from, you know, vision observations, but these tasks were from actually low dimensional state information, right? For example, the orientation of the cube 
is known. The location of the fingers is known, but the dynamics are still complex because there is contact involved. So if, if you don't do robotics, you know, don't worry about, um, you know, these reward functions and what is the state representation. I think your takeaway should be that if you can learn a model, model can help you be more sample efficient than a model free system. And the same methods were also applied to you know these mini robots or small robots which are moving around over here right so these robots initially when they start off they just move their legs randomly but by the end of training you know they end up learning how to walk on these trajectories to summarize this part so what we looked at a method is where we collect data we learn a model Given a reward function, we can find actions. So let's call this method A of doing model learning. And now, you know, I have a question for everyone or a poll for everyone. And now we can probably see the poll. And the poll is which of the following is true about model learning using method A? Right. Option one is that the learned model is generic and can be used for a wide range of tasks. And option B is this model is specific to a single task. And so we give it, you know, some 10 seconds of thought and you know, register your vote. So I see, you know, we are Almost there. Couple of you still left. Okay, I'm going to close it in five seconds. Okay, so let's see what people thought. Right. So six of you believe that this model is generic and can be used for a wide range of tasks. And 12 of you think this model is specific to a single task. Right. So, you know, can someone who believes this is specific to a single task say, why is this specific to a single task? Or was this, you know, a guess that this is specific to a single task? Or maybe, you know, someone who said the model is generic and can be used for a wide range of tasks can say out, you know, why do they think that the model is useful for many tasks? Nope, seems like you know, people need a morning coffee on a Thursday morning. Um, I thought it might be dependent on the assumption we're making on the collecting data uh, such that I think if we collect the data from the multiple MDPs, then I think it, there is a possibility that it might be generable to the multiple task. But I think if the collect data is from only one MDP, I thought it's only from one task only. Okay. That's a, that's a fair that's a fair point that it depends on how we are collecting the data. I think that's a good point. So over here, you know what we are doing is we are collecting data which is being influenced by the reward function. Like why is that? Because we learn a, we have some data to begin with. We learn a model with that, and then you know, we find actions which maximize the reward function, and then we add those actions back to our data set, right? So we are collecting data, which is helping us maximize the reward function. 
And therefore, the distribution of data that we're going to see is going to be specific to the reward function that we have. So although you might think, you know, learned models are generic, that they are predicting ST, that from given ST and AT, they can predict ST plus one, which they are, but we are not uniformly sampling the data. Right? We are sampling the data, which is specifically trying to optimize the reward function. So in contrast, consider method B. Suppose in method B, what I do is I collect an initial data set. And suppose I can collect this initial data set by doing a lot of random actions. Then I learn a model. And then I try to find actions which optimize this model. And for this, you know, we have a new poll for this particular method, which is method B. And you know, the question is, which of the following is true for model using method B, right? Is the, met is the model now generic and can be used for a wide range of tasks or is this model specific to a reward function? So when we give it, you know, 10 seconds of thought and well, then we'll look at, you know, what people think. So last five seconds to go. It seems like, you know, for this question, we have much less polling than the last one. So, you know, everyone who is, you know, still on the fence, you know, it's time to vote. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one. Last chance to vote to end the poll now. So, you know, let's see what people think, right? So 11 of you think that the model is generic and five of you think it's specific to a single task. So maybe someone who thinks it's specific to a single task, you know, maybe you want to say, why do you think so? No response to that. So, you know, one, one reason why you might believe that this is specific to a single task, or so this is generic and can solve many tasks, is because my data set doesn't depend on the reward function. Right? So, if, you know, I could collect a data set which, you know, spawns the entire state space and then learn a model then of course, you know, this model is generic and can be used for many, many different tasks by just changing the reward function. But, you know, in practice, we cannot span the entire state space. So we, you know, for example, might collect data in small part of the state space by doing random actuations. So now if there are, you know, multiple tasks, for example, you know, if you want to walk and jump, and maybe turn left and turn right, you know, maybe you have collected enough data that you have learned the system dynamics, which is low dimensional, right? For example, um, you know, suppose I have a ball which is moving, and if I just move the ball on like the bottom left of the room, you know, it's going to move in the same way in the top right of the room. Right, so I don't need to collect data both in the bottom left and the top right. I can just select data in the bottom left. So many times, you know, by collecting data, even in a constrained setup, you know, we could end up learning models which generalize to a large part of the state space and, you know, then uh, find actions. Right. But, you know, it really depends on how we got the initial data set as is you know, pointed on the chat also. So the difference between method A and method B is, in method A, we are using the reward function to bias data collection. In method B, we are not using the reward function to bias data collection, but relying on some other strategy, which is task agnostic to collect this data set. 
So, you know, let's maybe look at, you know, one more poll just on these two methods, method A and method B. And, you know, it's now on your screen. So if I'm evaluating on a single task, right, then which of the following is true? That method A will outperform method B if both are trained and evaluated on a single task, or will the reverse of it be true? So maybe give it, you know, 10 seconds to think and answer. Okay, so I think I'm going to close the poll because you know it's almost uni vocal over here, or almost. It seems like you know 15 of you think that method A will outperform method B if both are trained and evaluated on a single task. So generally speaking, you know this is going to be true, and the reason being that. You know that we are collecting data which is being influenced by the reward function, whereas there could be a big mismatch between the initial data set and the data we require to optimize the reward function. So broadly speaking, you know between method A and method B, you know method A is task specific. There isn't really a covariate shift problem if you are considering that one task, because you know suppose you collect you know, you produce a sequence of actions, right? For which, you know, the model is not working well, right? You can always add them back and update the model, right? So because of this loop of optimization of actions and learning of models are happening simultaneously, we can overcome the covariate shift problem. And therefore, it can end up having higher performance on a single task. The method B, you know, if the initial data set is collected uh, nicely, you know, sometimes just random actuation, random actuation of the system is enough to characterize the system. Right? Many times it is not, but many times it is. Right? In those cases, you know, we could learn a model which optimizes you know a new reward function which is given eventually but because you know the model is doing well across a gen like a more broader set of data its performance on the specific data required to optimize the reward function might be lower so there's this trade off between you know using models which are influenced by reward functions and trying to learn models which are maybe agnostic to the reward function. So what we are going to now look is, you know, at a bunch of methods which are trying to learn models, you know, which are agnostic of maybe the eventual reward function, right? Or they use natural rewards, which are not human specified necessarily, or they do not require human to handcraft, you know, um, a very precise reward function. And, you know, those set of methods are what we're going to call, you know, self-supervised model learning. Now you might have heard, you know, self-supervised learning in context of feature learning. Now that is somewhat different but a similar idea that we are trying to minimize the human supervision required to define my reward function in this case. And in case of feature learning, you know, we are trying to reduce the human supervision required to annotate the data. Right? But, so that is something self-supervised feature learning is something we are going to look more at a later lecture. In this one, we are going to look at self-supervised uh, robot learning or self-supervised model learning. So, you know, the simplest 
I'll start off with a very simple example of self-supervised forward models. And then, you know, we'll build up. So now consider, you know, this problem where I have this ball and I want to hit this green ball and I want to figure out what force I need to apply. So suppose if I have this force, then the ball will go in a particular order. Similarly, I can imagine the effect of a different force. This is actually what a forward model helps me do. And you know, I can imagine effects of many, many, many different forces. Then I can look at you know, the force which does best in my imagination or in simulation. I can use that force and output that as the optimal action. But for doing this, I need a model which predicts how is this ball going to move in the future. So one you know, simple way you can construct this is to say, well, assume I can track these balls and I'm going to take a window around these balls. I'm going to augment four such frames, Y4, so that maybe I can account for the speed and the velocity and the acceleration, pass them to the CNN, have you know force also as input, pass this to an LSTM so I can keep track of how the ball has been moving and then predict where the ball is going to be in the future, right? Over here, we are taking the like the images as inputs and predicting the velocities of the ball. This helps us predict where the ball is going to move. So, for example, you know, if you know your ground truth motion of balls are given on the bottom row, where dark means it's earlier in time and light means that it's moving forward in time. So you see that you know, if you apply learning techniques, we can learn or model collisions which are happening with walls, right? And you know, on the right, what you can see is a trajectory coming from a physics simulator. On the left, you can see a trajectory imagined by the model. So what you would notice is you know sometimes the ball will kind of jitter around and move, but you know we can model collisions. Uh, fairly well. Right? Now this problem, you know, becomes much more extreme when you end up having you no know, three balls. You know, so look at the kind of interactions you know that end up happening, which are unrealistic. It's almost like there is some magnetic force in play when the balls come close to each other, but when they are far from each other, you know, things look reasonably fine. So, you know, why am I showing you this? Just to illustrate that a simple setup where, you know, I can just hit the balls, I can apply forces and I can learn models. And then I can leverage these models for any reward I can be given or any task I can be given. Like for example, one task would be hit another ball. Another task would be, you know, put this ball in a side corner. Right? once I have a model, you know, I can perform those tasks. And other thing to realize is that even on this simple task, you know, the models are not perfect, especially as you know the number of balls increase. Now, this is something you know which has been you know subject to research, and latest and greatest papers in this domain would you know make use of something like a graph neural network to model interactions between balls. So one question which I have is, you know, is this model trained in a supervised or an unsupervised fashion? So it is trained with supervised learning, but the supervision is to predict the future state. But you know, there is no other human defined reward. So in, in that sense, you know, because there's no human annotations, it is unsupervised. But the way you are training it is, you know, using a supervised learning loss, where the supervision is what is the future. So can, can I ask answer? a follow up? Yeah, go on. So I, I think my question precisely is about the, you said the state, right? So this, right now the state is velocity in this case. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay, so is that possible to use actually just the uh, kind of unsupervised, unsupervised uh, fashion? Like you, you, you just want to use the image as the uh, legs state. So instead of know precisely where the ball or velocity is, uh, so is uh, I saw some you know kind of a model learning in that fashion as well. Yes, yeah, so we will come to it very shortly. I see. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So over here, when I was you know talking about maybe unsupervised, you know what I was talking about is there is no reward function that you are trying to optimize, right? And sometimes, you know, I think there's some technology in computer vision, which is mature. For example, object tracking is somewhat mature. So in some situations, you could use that. But as you're saying, you know, many situations, you want to, you know, directly work from images. Yeah, right. exactly. And we're going, exactly. we going, we going to look at that. Right? I mean, okay. there are pros and cons of both of those things. I see. So wait, wait, wait for, you know, maybe a few slides or maybe the next lecture. And, you know, we are trying, we are going to answer that question. So, you know, as was pointed out, you know, I mean, over here, this is a simplistic setup and we were assuming things like, you know, I have access to the velocity of the balls, right? Instead of doing that, you know, maybe what I want is, you know, for my robotic systems to explore their environment, for example, you know, by trying to push objects, you know, play around with ropes or just move around in the office and all they have is access to images, right? So they have images coming in, they perform an action and they get the next image. So what do we do in these setups, right? So for example, I have an image, I perform an experiment, which is conduct an action or execute an action in the real world we get a new image, right? And we have this triplet, XT, AT, XT plus one, from which we can learn a model, right? Now, you know, and what kind of models, right? I mean, we have been discussing about these forward models, which predict what is going to happen in the future, right? So one choice of what is going to happen in the future is to predict this image exactly pixel by pixel. And this is what we're going to call forward models in pixel space. And there has been, you know, a bunch of work in this domain, you know, for example, these references down here. So, you know, one example is uh, this work, which was coming out of Google Brain, where, you know, we were pushing objects and this robot is, pretty much executing random, it, it does the push in a random direction by a random amount. It is unaware of you know, what objects might be present, right? It gets an image, it says, I'm going to do an action, it does an action and that gives us data. And you know, then we use a combination of just what we saw CNN plus LSTM. You know, a version of CNN plus LSTM is also applied but now instead of predicting velocities as was there in the previous case, we are outputting images. And you know, if you see, this is what the model ends up predicting. Right? So here are you know, predictions of the model when we are applying you know, actions. So now how do we use this model? Right? So suppose here's an object that we want to push. The user is going to specify a goal, right? For example, he clicks and it is the green point. So I want to move the red point to the green point. And then the robot executes, uh, you know, this push over here. So what is the robot doing over here? Right. So, you know, what we had was, you know, the initial image of, of the world, right? And, you know, we are collecting, you know, data which is producing, you know, future images. So one thing you can say is, well, this is the future image that I want to be true. Find me a sequence of actions. And how do you find it? Using the cross entropy method, right? Other thing, you know, you could do is in, that what you can do is you can access the intermediate feature representation of the network, 
and just try to match those intermediate feature representation. So, you know, turns out the way, you know, they're making predictions in this particular work is instead of predicting the image pixel by pixel, what they predict is how much does each pixel shift, right? So when they're making these predictions, given image XT and AT, instead of saying, what is the pixel as XT plus one, they would just say, how much is this pixel going to shift? And now that allows you to specify goals in this particular way, where you can say this pixel should shift by this much amount. And this is exactly the model that you, know, you have learned by doing this self-supervised or unsupervised interaction, if you, you know, want to call that. You know, while you know these things work to some extent, and you know they can displace objects by a small amount. You know, it's very hard for them to displace objects by large amounts, and the reason is because you know seeing these videos, you can see how bloody the predictions are. And because the predictions are bloody, that means that I cannot really predict far ahead in the future. And therefore, I cannot really, you know, push objects by large amounts. Now you might ask, you know, why are these predictions blurry? So, you know, one potential answer is that there's some uncertainty in how the objects are going to move, right? That is one potential answer. The second is, if you look at the scene, right, what is, the biggest thing in the scene. And the biggest thing in the scene is a robot arm. So the first thing you try to model is the robot arm itself. So you spend most of your energy in modeling the robot arm. Because if you were to predict accurately what is going to happen in the future, you know, first you'll get the background after the background, because the background is never going to change. And then you're going to model the robot arm. Only once you model the robot arm, are you going to model the objects. And okay, because objects are smaller than the arm, even if you don't get the objects correct, your loss function is not going to be that high. Right? So that is a potential disadvantage one ends up having when trying to directly predict the images, that you are unable to prioritize what is it that you care about. And for example, over here, we don't care about the motion of the hand, but what we do care about is the motion of objects. So, you know, if we could predict the images accurately, everything is going to be fine. But, you know, turns out predicting how the world is going to look like exactly pixel by pixel is very hard. But I think a more important question to ask is, is it just hard or is this even the right thing to do? So I'm again reusing this example from our first lecture, right, where we discuss, right, for example, if I break this glass bottle, you know, imagine how hard is it going to be to model where this water goes or where every piece of glass goes. It's extremely hard to predict that. But it's easy to predict that if I drop the bottle, it is going to break and that I should not step on the bottle. Right? But while it is easy to predict the bottle is going to break, you know, this requires someone to supervise and provide breaking as a potential thing to predict, right? It is a label that I need to have access to. So if I want to be, you know, self-supervised or I don't want to assume that humans are interjecting and specifying what is important to predict, then I have to predict images, but that becomes hard or, but, and there are things that we would like to predict, but they require supervision. But then the question becomes is, you know, what, how, like, can, can we do better than predicting images pixel by pixel, but learn some good representation of the image that we can make predictions in. So this is 
an open research question that we will spend you know fair bit of a lecture you know talking about so we'll cycle back to this part but you know before we cycle back i will you know briefly you know cover two other case studies to give you a sense of you know what we mean by self supervision and before i jump into it i mean are there any questions on the previous section Nope. Okay. So let's look at first grasping. So consider I want to know how to grasp objects. Right. So one idea is to get humans to mark grasp locations. For example, I can draw these boxes. We say the gripper, my two fingers, like one finger should come on the green line on the left, the other finger should come on the green line on the right. Then I can close those fingers and pick up the object. Right, so that's one way how we can approach grasping. And the question we're going to ask is, can we remove the requirement for this human supervision? Could the robot learn this on its own? Right. So this is, you know, work done by a little Pinto, you know, five years ago. So over here, what the system is going to do is, it's going to move its gripper to a random position on the table and then close its fingers, right? As you see. And you know what we want is over time the system should improve. So this system, you know, collected fifty thousand trials, which took around seven hundred hours on this particular robot. Right. So sometimes you would, you know, when you pick up the object or when you close your fingers, you'll get an object. Sometimes you wouldn't get an object. But it is very easy to know when you got the object, right? For example, because if you have the object, you wouldn't be able to close the fingers, right? Versus, you know, if you had no object, you can very easily close the fingers. So now this is a very cheap source of supervision. Right? So a human does need to specify this fact that if your gripper is not closing, it means there's an object. But it, but Imagine how much simpler that is to provide, you know, these kind of boxes for each object. So over here, there's a very simple heuristic that allows us to collect large amounts of data and then improve the system. So let's, you know, look at this, uh, you know, this problem in you know, more details. So over here, I'm just telling you how do we verify graph success, right, which we just discussed. And, you know, these kind of signals, if you can generate, you know, are typically what people refer to as self supervisions, things that you can predict, which help you perform a task that are very, very cheap to get. Right? For example, knowing whether you're trying to close the fingers and the fingers don't move, you know, that's pretty cheap supervision. So, you know, how was this method working? You know, you get this, you know, image. Now, there are two things you could do. You know, one thing you can do is, I can, I'm going to place a gripper anywhere in the table. Other thing you can do is, you know, you can use some object detectors to detect where the objects are and constrain the gripper just to move over there. And I can approach the, you know, the object, close my gripper and verify if I got the object or not. Now, these two choices, whether to move the gripper anywhere on the table or to only move it where the objects are more likely to happen is just a matter of data efficiency, right? The method will work equally well if you let it go anywhere on the table. It will just require, you know, a lot more trials to get that to work or to collect enough data. So, you know, how do they exactly do it? So given a crop of an image, right? For example, and suppose I run, 
I do background subtraction over here. You know, everything is white, so it's easy to do background subtraction. Relatively easy to do background subtraction. I'll get you know a bunch of boxes. I can you know choose you know a position in the box, which is x comma y, and an orientation. Then you know what I do is. I take this image, pass it through the network, and, or sorry, I, you know, what I do is I go and execute this grasp. And around this center point, I crop the image, which is my sensory input. So I have this is my sensory input, this cropped image. And I'm going to execute a robot action, which goes through this position x comma y and attempts to grasp at theta. At angle theta. Now, you know what we are going to get is some positive grass samples, and we're going to get a lot of negative grass samples, right? Where the robot is unable to pick up the object. You know, why is this? Because initially we really don't know what is good and what is bad, right? What are good grass samples and what are bad grass samples? I mean, we know, sorry. We don't know before execution whether the grasp is going to succeed or not, right? So you know we get this image, we have a neural network, and we predict. You know, suppose, you know, just like, um, you know, in DQN, you saw there were n actions over here. These n actions denote, you know. N different orientation with the gripper. You know, we experimented with one of those orientations. And depending on if it was positive or negative, we can propagate the gradient back. And we'll end up learning, you know, given this image, what actions lead to a successful grasp, right? So I can predict the probability of the grasp given this image and the orientation that I have. And at test time, you know, what we can do is given an image, we can sample many patches randomly. For example, pass each of these patches as inputs, right? And try to predict which orientation is going to hold the object. And for whatever orientation, you know, I have highest confidence, I can go and execute. So this is, you know, what the method ends up, you know, learning, or this is how it learns and how it tests. And, you know, after collecting some amount of data, you know, it learns to, you know, pick up objects one by one and clear, you know, the clutter over here, for example. And so I think the video is sped up at some point, right? We'll see that, you know, it is able to successfully uh, you know, pick up these objects. We can compare, you know, how the performance is improving over time. So what you see is that as time is progressing, you know, the accuracy is going higher and higher. You know, you do you you do better on you know seen objects, and you know you do worse on unseen novel objects. But as you collect more data accuracy improves to scale this up you know google you know put seven or i think you know n number of robots seven i think to just scale this process which was proposed by you know level pinto some time back and you know, this also answers you know Siddharth, your question yeah they did have you know all these cluttered objects um being over here right so they are trying to pick up objects in you know cluttered scenes and using this process. Now we can you know tie this back into some of the queue learning work or you know some of the reinforcement learning work that we have also looked at. So we are collecting you know these offline. So one one strategy is to you know I just collect the data set and then I train my system. The other is I am collecting my data set but I'm also improving my system, right? So in the last method, 
right? We only had one step action prediction, right? I just needed to predict the orientation of the grip. What they did was, you know, they expanded upon, you know, the action space and made it, you know, so that you could predict a sequence of actions instead of just a single action. And because you had a sequence of actions, now, you know, what you can do is you can define a Q function and the supervision for Q function comes in a similar way, right? The, the same way we get a reward is if I can close my finger, I know I have, I don't have an object. If I am unable to close, then I know I have an object. Right? So that is how you learn a Q function. But instead of having an actor that you might have say in DDPG or TD3, we, you can simply use the cross entropy method that we discussed to find the optimal actions. Right. And, you know, turns out, you know, if you have trained this system on cluttered objects, you end up getting, you know, interesting emergent behavior. So I'm going to, you know, for example, if I get this as an image, right? What will I, what am I going to do? Right? I get this as an image. You know, I have this image. I have my action. I want to maximize my sum of rewards. How is that represented? Is through a Q network, right? That we have learned. Now to test, we sample actions and we use, you know, the cross entropy method for doing this sampling. And now we can see, you know, what the system ends up doing. You know, you find it ends up learning this strategy of singulating objects one by one, right? You cannot really grasp the object without moving them, right? So you learn, you see the robot has learned this strategy to push in a way which moves the objects apart so that it can go and grasp these objects, right? So this I would say is a example of emergent behavior, right? Where what is emerging is this poking strategy to push the objects that can go and grasp. This is an example where, you know, we assumed very little to begin with, right? We did not assume nothing. We did assume something, right? We assumed, what does it mean? How do I know whether the object is grasped or not? But with that very little knowledge and lots of data, we are able to learn something quite complex as you are seeing in this particular video. Any questions on this part? Nope. Okay. So I think we are almost out of time. So I am going to end the lecture right now and take any questions anyone might have and we can continue on self-supervised learning and model learning next time. So there were two lectures, you know, separate of model learning, self-supervised learning. I think I'm going to do it where they're crisscrossing each other because I think you will probably get a more holistic perspective that way.